Hello, everybody, and welcome. I am so excited for our presentation today. Uh, I'm Peter Goldstein, founder of We Did It That Health, and our mission is to help grow the plant based communities by finding tools and processes and practices for us, the grassroots ambassadors, to be able to inspire our friends and loved ones and acquaintances to change lifestyle. You know, we have all been so frustrated when we try to talk to somebody else who's not plant-based and show them that there is an alternative to their pain, to their suffering, to animal suffering, to the climate change. Um, and it's all a plant-based lifestyle, yet they don't want to listen. So today we have a very special event uh, with Angela Crawford, Dr. Crawford, who wrote the ebook that if you don't have yet, then uh, you know, let us know and we'll make sure you have it. It is our free gift for answering the simple one question survey uh, at we did it health. So if you haven't done that yet, please go to we did it health and answer the simple one question survey. I'm also very excited for our upcoming live in-person summit on June 23rd in Cleveland in collaboration with the National Health Association. Uh, Wanda and Mark Huberman, our executive director and president, and, and we are so grateful that we get a chance to, to have our live summit the day before their wonderful annual conference in, in Cleveland, Ohio, which will be uh, June 24th through the 26th. So without any further ado, I want to welcome everybody. I'm so glad you're here. I can't tell you how excited I am for all that we're doing and, and for everybody who's participating and, and appreciating and enjoying what we're doing. So with that, I would love to introduce Dr. Angela Crawford and uh, she will tell you a little bit about herself and her background, her amazing experience uh, as, as, a, as a psychologist. And, uh, and so with that, I would bring her on. And there she is. <laughs> Hello, I'm so happy to be here and um, welcome to everybody that's watching, whether it be right now or in the future. And um, just wanted to do a brief introduction. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm having trouble here. Um, okay, so we have everybody on screen for the moment. Um, okay. Go ahead, Angela. Okay. Um, my background is in psychotherapy, and you know, a lot of my work has been with a mixture of things like trauma, mind body approaches to help with all kinds of issues. Um, and you know, 15 years ago, I became vegetarian. As I learned about ethical reasons, um, you know, including the treatment of workers, um, the treatment of animals, and as I really, really continued to learn and read, um, I just knew I couldn't eat meat anymore. I learned that, um, fortunately, that way of eating also was the best thing for my health, um, that I have a family history of heart disease and, you know, lost parents too young to lifestyle-related um, illnesses. So, you know, there's certainly personal reasons also that this is the healthiest lifestyle for me as well. And so as I really dove into a vegan lifestyle a few years ago, fully committed myself, I knew that I wanted to make a difference for for animals, the planet, and human health and mental health. And, you know, my special interest is how eating a plant-powered diet along with a vegan lifestyle can really be beneficial actually for our mental and emotional and spiritual well-being on many levels, you know, from the nutritional level to just actually living in alignment with our deepest compassion. So um, I'm really honored to be here. Thank you. Well, thank you. And, uh, and I will learn how to navigate this. Uh, Angela, thank you so much. And with that, I would love to welcome Victoria Moran, Main Street Vegan, an absolute leader of this movement. She has written a number of books. She has Main Street Aca uh, Vegan Academy, where uh, she certifies and trains people about the vegan lifestyle and so many wonderful things. So with that, please tell us more about your work and yourself, uh, Victoria. 
Oh, thank you so much, Peter. It is just such a pleasure to be here. And I'm so excited about We Did It Got Dot Health because you have thought of something that nobody ever thought of before. Let's go at this at the communication level. And I am first and foremost a communicator. My life is about words as a writer and a speaker and a teacher. And so this wonderful effort to get our message out to people in a kind and effective way is absolutely thrilling. And I'm honored to be a founding ambassador. Well, thank you. Thank you for being here. And Victoria, um, I know that you, you have some urgent needs on, around your time requirements. So why don't we go ahead and, and invite you to, to do your presentation and, and tell us uh, what you have. I know you have some very exciting things that you're doing with food styles. And uh, please please go ahead and, and uh, share share what you have. And then, then what we'll do is we'll, uh, we'll have some questions for you. And I know you'll need to leave a little bit earlier. And, and then Angela has a few things that uh, we would need for her to tell us uh, about the second and third of the seven uh, best practices in the ebook. So uh, with that, uh, let's go ahead with Victoria and, and uh, your presentation. Okay, well, in the wonderful world of technology, we know that the screen sharing worked a couple of minutes ago. I'm doing the same thing that I did then and it's not working. Can you possibly see, Peter, if maybe um, it, that was turned off or that other people are not allowed to screen share at this point? You, you know, I haven't changed anything. Oh, it says so. screen sharing was canceled. Oh, who canceled screen well, I'm sharing? I'm not sure. Let me try one more time. Hi, everybody. And, and <laughs> forgiveness asked for all of this technical stuff. You know, my share button on the second screen is grayed out. It says StreamYard wants to share contents of your screen. Well, thank you, StreamYard. You know, this is a little bit like, like our topic, you know. We want the people that we're trying to communicate with to really feel like we're on their side. As someone who dislikes technology a lot, when I see StreamYard wants to share the content of the screen, it makes me feel better about StreamYard. Um, still cannot share. So I'm just going to get started. And Peter, if you figure something out while I am speaking, I would absolutely love to share the slides. They will add a great deal. So please just jump in and interrupt with your voice if you come up with any way that I could do that. So well, and uh, let me ask you, Victoria, I'm sorry to interrupt you. I will look for it as you start speaking. But uh, if you would, are you are you willing to share your screens? Uh, your slides if somebody asks you for them so how would they do that if, if um, they're available i don't to think them. that just the naked slides are going to be that okay. helpful to anybody they're okay. they're really just pictures that are kind of prompts for for what i'm talking about okay so All right. i'm going to give it one more shot and if it doesn't work i'm just gonna assume that we are let me try one other thing there's something window let's try that I'm feeling good about that. So is anybody seeing my screen instead of just my picture? No, we're, we're, we're just seeing you. You are just seeing me. Okay. Oh, here. You know what? Here it is. I, here we go. Yay. <laughs> well, thank you. And thanks to everybody who was doing positive thinking out there, because I know that that has a lot to do with it. So, I know that we are talking this morning about breaking barriers, and I'd like to suggest that we can break barriers with attractivism, which is something that I came up with. It's also called attraction activism. There's something in the 12-step programs where they say that if somebody wants what you have, then they're going to be willing to go to any length to get it. So we want to have what other people want, and then we want to be able to communicate it in a way that is humane and that speaks to each person where that person is. So a little bit about me. 
I was a fat child in a fat phobic family. That problem went on into my early 30s. And this is a picture of myself. Somebody looked at this and said, oh, you should call this picture hefty hippie. That's not very kind. The fact was that at age 20, I was about 180 pounds. I was pre-diabetic and I just didn't know what to do. I was vegetarian. I, I had realized that I didn't want to eat animals uh, when I was 19 years old, but I absolutely ate everything else in, in vast quantity. But I was lucky that some people believed in me. So in this picture, I'm showing Freya Dinshaw, the late H.J. Dinshaw, founders of the American Vegan Society, way back in 1960, which is just stunning cool, to yeah. think that people in America were thinking about this topic in 1960. Um, but I'm sorry to interrupt you, Victoria. Your slides are not advancing. They're not advancing. They are for me. Are you still back on this? Oh, home my screen? goodness. Yeah. So our... Our, our, I don't see it advancing. Okay. Well, you is there something you have to do, Peter, to allow that? No, no, it's, no. it's Victoria's screen share. Mm. Okay. Well, then I'm going to just go ahead and and pretend like there are no slides. We, so we try try clicking on the on the um, on the side there on the sidebar on the slide that you're wanting to show. Well, I'm in full screen, so there is okay. no. Slide sidebar. Okay, okay, so let's, we'll All just right, do this audibly. Ahead. They say that only 16% of people are auditory. So if you are visual or kinesthetic, just pretend that you're auditory. Mm -hmm. This is a good exercise. We're going to step into somebody else's shoes. So um, I did have some people who believed in me. And even though I was slipping and sliding, I learned about veganism. We didn't have the term whole food, plant-based diet then. And for me, that's probably good because if anybody had told me that this was one more diet, I would have probably head for the hills because I had been on diets from the time I was a small child. But when this was presented as a lifestyle that had benefit for others, that really, really helped me. And in those days, if you were vegan, you were pretty much whole food plant-based because <laughs> there weren't all the vegan processed foods that we have now. So that's my story. But let's talk now about your story and the story of people that you want to help, that you want to share this wonderful thing with. There's a very widely known quotation from Ralph Waldo Emerson. He said way back in 1875, what you do speaks so loudly, I cannot hear what you say. So this is attractivism at its core. So if this is working for you, people are gonna see that. People are gonna know that you're not taking medication for cholesterol anymore. People are gonna know that you're not using a CPAP machine anymore. People are going to find out that you are no longer type two diabetic and maybe they believe that once you became diabetic, that was a life sentence that would never change. Your life is sharing with them, you know what, it really can change and then they'll wanna know. So it's very important that we don't start talking about how great this is, especially with the people close to us who are going to see us over time before we ourselves know that we're in. So my suggestion would be for the first six months, don't bring it up to anybody, even if you think it might save their life. You're going to do better in the long term if you make sure that you've got this down before talking about it. Now, people will ask you questions and you can certainly answer them, but answer them, I don't really want to say evasively, but you don't want to be zealous about this because then if you just happen to say, oh gosh, everybody else is having mom's cheesecake, I'm going to have some just this once, then that's going to negate everything that you said. So be sure you're in before you try to bring in others. Then you want to share with iMessages. And this is a way to share without selling. So Peter mentioned the National Health Association, a wonderful group, the oldest group of plant-based health 
promoters in all the world. Uh, their predecessor society was called the American Natural Hygiene Society. And a gentleman named James Michael Lennon headed that up for many years. And he would say that people would ask him, well, what's wrong with eating meat? And he'd say, eh, I don't know that there's really anything wrong with it. And they'd say, but you don't eat it, do you? And he'd say, eh, not very often. And they'd say, well, how long's it been? And he'd say, uh, 23 years. <laughs> so you can kind of get from that little anecdote that whenever people have to keep asking you, they're going to keep asking. So the more we push, the more they're likely to pull away. But when we just be, can just be attractive specimens of what we're trying to do. And I don't mean that we have to look like the cover of the Sports Illustrated swimsuit issue. We just need to be comfortable in our own skins, happy in our own lives and loving the food that we eat. And that's one of the most important things that we can remember to do. And that is to share wonderful food. So you want to be the person known for bringing the best food to the potluck or the family dinner. And you don't wanna be pushing it on people and saying, there's no sugar in this and there's no salt and there's no butter and there's no eggs. They don't need to hear all that. You give them the recipe, they can see what's not in there, but they're gonna be focused more on what is in there and on how utterly delicious our food can be. Because so many people have the idea that there's two kinds of food. There's good food, and there's healthy food. And somebody said to me once, you have eaten the way you eat for so long that you have forgotten what good is. But when she started eating my food, she backtracked on that because the food is really good and it has to be. Our food has to be better than other people's. So Peter also mentioned something that I've come up with recently, which is called food styles. And I'll tell you the little story of how this came about. I was in the nomad district of Manhattan. If you know Manhattan, I'm talking around 27th and, and Broadway. And it was time to eat. And I saw this little cafe and it was so sparse and so spare that I just knew it was going to have the kind of food that I like to eat, whole food, plant-based dishes. And I was right. I walked in and I saw the menu on the wall, very, very sparse, little black squares with white <laughs> printing of, of the bowls, you know, bowls with a basis of, of kale or, or brown rice. And then we're going to put on top of that broccoli balls or edamame or hummus. So I was just in restaurant heaven. And I sat down in this place that was extremely uncomfortable on purpose because they were trying to be so hip and so chic and so trendy. And that whole minimalist thing is very big right now. So I spoke with some of the other people who were there and I found out I was the only vegetarian in the place. They weren't there because this was a vegan menu, because this was a whole food plant-based menu. They were there because this restaurant is one of Matthew Kenny's. And Matthew Kenny is a very revered and very trendy contemporary chef. They were there because this place is getting um, some buzz and, and it's a great place to spot celebrities. And I realized that these people were at this restaurant called Scene, spelled S-C-E-N, <laughs> not because of the food or the health or the ethics. They were there because it was trendy and their food style is hipster. So when you run into people like that, you know that they are looking for the, the next social climbing food. So we can think historically, um, the Waldorf salad was such a big deal in the 1920s. Uh, in the 1970s, it was quiche. And recently it was avocado toast. And then they put that on the menu at Dunkin' Donuts and now it's no longer trendy. So with people like this, you can talk about the timeliness and the trendiness of a whole food plant-based diet. And then we've got person number two, and that is the health stir. So a lot of people are 
interested in their health. And a lot of people believe that they're eating for health who don't know about how we eat. They've never heard of a whole food plant-based diet, but they do try to make the best choices. Now, sometimes they're going to be very surprised when they hear from us that we're not eating salmon. We're not eating chicken with the skin taken off. We're not dousing everything in olive oil. So we have to honor that they've done their research, they've been reading, they've talked to their doctors, they've talked to their experts, they have their way of looking at things. So we need to find where we have points of agreement. And we need to be very gentle in terms of bringing up the aspects of healthy eating about which we're different from what they're already thinking. And we also need to have some results because if they've been doing whatever they're doing and they're still diabetic or their cholesterol hasn't moved, then we can just share with them with an I message, well, this is what's happened to me. Then the next person, the next food style is the foodie. And foodies are equal opportunity eaters. They just love food. They love all kinds of foods. You tell them you're eating whole food plant-based, they wanna come over and see what that's like. They want to experience it. Now, if another friend has said that they figured out how to make a four cheese pizza with a fifth kind of cheese in the crust, they'll want to do that too because they're foodies. They have this reverential view of all kinds of food. So when they hear about people who eat like us, they think we've given up whole food groups. It's, it's almost disrespectful of food, which they honor so much. So what we want to do with them is to play up how beautiful our food is and, and to interest them in maybe some of the restaurants who have food the way that, that we eat it. And, and they will love recipes. So share the recipes. Oh, here's uh, Mrs. Esselstyn's mashed potatoes. And I know we just have to just bite our tongues to not say, and it has no butter and it has no milk and it has no salt. But we don't need to say that. They're going to see that when they get the recipe. So we're going to reach them through food. There was an old saying back in the day, the way to a man's heart is through his stomach. Well, the way to a foodie's heart is definitely through their stomach and through their taste buds. Then number four food style is regular Joe, regular Jane. And this is probably most of the American population. So a regular Joe doesn't have a lot of um, adventurous spirit when it comes to food, like the foodie, I mean, they'll just eat something from a, a street vendor or from the most expensive restaurant in town and they think it's all great. Regular Joe, regular Jane wants food that is familiar. They want the kind of food that they grew up on. They want familiar names, familiar products. So when we talk about not having processed foods, that's going to feel to them like they're abandoning a friend. Because when they hear a line like with a name like Smucker's, it's got to be good or everybody doesn't like something, but nobody doesn't like Sara Lee, that means something to them. Because these, these people, these companies, they feel kind of a friendly relationship with and they have a lot of brand loyalty. So they're going to probably see whole food plant-based people as elitist. They're going to think that we're a bunch of know-it-alls who want to keep them from everything that they hold dear. But what we need to share with them is, you know, we're eating really basic food. I mean, everybody loves peanut butter sandwiches. Put a little peanut butter on a sliced apple. It's absolutely delicious. And you can have things like chili and lasagna and mom's meatloaf without the meat all done in a whole food plant-based way. And then you can get them to warm a little bit to the idea that you're not weird and you're not trying to exclude anybody. Then food style five is the traditionalist. And these are people who are very, very close to the kinds of foods of their tradition. Perhaps this is their region. I grew up in Kansas City, and until I went vegetarian, I was very proud of the Kansas City steak and Kansas City barbecue. Of course, you can barbecue vegetables. But maybe it's Louisiana gumbo or New England clam chowder or Tex-Mex chili or buffalo wings. People tend to get very attached to these sorts of things that are part of their identity. Then we also have 
the personal, ethnic, uh, religious kind of, of um, identity that people have. I mean, for example, I come from an Italian family on my father's side, and I'm not sure that I could have managed to have gone consistently whole food plant-based if it weren't for whole grain pasta, because, you know, I'm Italian. I got to have my pasta every now and then. And so if you can honor this about people and present the whole food plant-based diet in terms of what to them is traditional, because otherwise you're basically asking them to turn their back on their family and their heritage and maybe their mother or their grandmother, and nobody wants to do that. So food style number seven is the naturalist. And naturalists are a fairly small group, but you will run into them. These are people who garden and maybe they forage for wild greens and edible flowers and mushrooms. If they eat meat, they're very likely to hunt and they are sure to have backyard chickens. And unless they are raw food people, they're going to bake their own bread. So the challenge that we have with the naturalist is that they believe that all the food that they see as provided by nature is what we are supposed to choose from. And the idea that we don't want to choose from eating animals and animal products is going to be a little bit hard for them. It's, it's almost anti-nature in their view that we want to do that. So we want to find where we have intersectionality with them. So maybe we garden and they garden. And maybe we have sprouts in our kitchen and we can share with them how cool it is to grow sprouts. Or maybe they don't know about microgreens. And, and we do. And so we stay away from the hunting and all that in the beginning, at least, because we want to find places to connect. And then finally, number eight food style is the gourmet or the Epicurean. And this is somebody for whom fine dining is a life value. The idea of exquisite food superbly presented means something to them. It has a lot of connections that don't really have to do with food. It has to do with perhaps uh, heritage or also having made it in life. Somebody might think, well, I was poor as a child. We didn't eat this way growing up. And now that I'm able to eat this way, this is absolutely the way that I am going to eat. So when we are looking at these folks, we, we want to help them understand that an elegant lifestyle can also be plant-based. There's nothing written in stone that you have to have meat and processed foods to have elegant food, to have food from a, a gourmet shop, to have food served in a, a beautiful, beautiful setting. I always think of a restaurant here in New York City. It's called a Delice and Saracen. It's 100% vegan, probably not 100% whole food plant-based, but it's French. It's traditional French cuisine like a gourmet would love. But for the first two years of its existence, they never told anybody that it was vegan. They just said French cuisine. And you'd look at the menu and there were things like escargot and coco vin, but it was vegan. And so they were reaching this market, people who wanted good French food, and it just happened to be vegan. So we can reach these people in our lives with a whole food plant-based approach while honoring the fact that they are indeed gourmet. And then we also want to remember that we have many aspects to ourselves and that we probably have uh, one predominating food style and a secondary food style. And if you look at your own shift to a whole food plant-based diet, you can see that maybe you didn't step too far away from being a traditionalist or from being a gourmet. And now you just do that whole food plant-based. But when you're out there trying to get somebody else to change, you don't wanna take them away from their identity as a regular Joe or their identity as a hipster. You wanna use that to bring them into this healthy animal saving and planet saving way of being on the earth.
So I hope that some of that spoke to somebody. And if you would like to read a, a full article about food styles, you can go to MainStreetVegan.net and look for uh, the posts that actually went up last week. So there's one ahead of it, uh, but it says food styles, the missing link in plant-based proselytizing. Back to Peter and Angela. Well, thank you so very much, Victoria. That's, that's wonderful. And you're such an amazing presenter. <clears throat> and I, I know that understanding where people are coming from and, and to, to be able to communicate with them and, and to bring them on to being whole food plan based. And probably there has to be some ways to blend their current, uh, current food styles, especially if it's traditional or, uh, you know, and that's, that's wonderful. It's great great to know, great information. And we look forward to hearing more from you about how to how to work with people in the different food styles. Thank so you thank so much. You. Yeah, thank you. And really do hope to see more from you on uh, on helping people transition based on their mm -hmm. food styles. That's, that's very good information. And with that, I'd love to invite Angela to talk a little bit about <laughs> Were you wanting to take any questions before Victoria has to leave first? Um, you bet. That's a great, great point. Uh, I know. Any, yes. Yeah, there is at least one question right there, I noticed, from Shannon. Um, what would you suggest for people who were once vegan but quit due to health complications from a not well-rounded diet? <clears throat> for example, hair falling out has been a common one, or food allergies to soy and nuts or soy and gluten. Right. <laughs> when you have an allergy, you avoid the allergy. <laughs> and so many people don't eat certain foods for whatever reason. And it's very difficult when we look at the world in that old four food groups kind of format. That was what I was taught in school, where you've got the, the meat group, the dairy group, the fruit and vegetable group, the bread and cereal group. And when that is, is the food universe, and then you say that you're going to take half of those away. Then you're left with only half the food anyway. And then if you have an allergy, we're taking out another chunk. If you've got two allergies, we're taking out even more. And it starts to look like your choices are very, very small. When we can look at it in a different way, we can look at it that humans are designed, evolved to eat plants. This is how our body works. And this is how life on earth works right now. This is something that we all need to do for environmental and, and other reasons. So we look at the plant kingdom as the totality of what we have to eat. And it's huge. I mean, every time I go to Chinatown, I see fruits and vegetables I've never seen before. And I've been eating fruits and vegetables exclusively for almost 40 years. So when you look at it this way, and then you think, okay, from this vast plant kingdom, I am not going to eat the soybean, or I am not going to eat the tree nut or the peanut, then that really doesn't take much away at all. Then in terms of these health situations that people talk about, it's so important to realize that we live on earth. This is not heaven. This is not Eden. We run into problems. Food is a cause of a lot of problems. I mean, we certainly know from the research that's been done in the whole food plant-based world that in terms of um, coronary heart disease, type two diabetes, obviously obesity, food is huge as a causative factor, but it isn't the cause of everything. So you mentioned hair loss, for instance, this can happen with pregnancy, this can happen with menopause, this can happen with the hormonal fluctuations of aging. There are so many causes, but what happens if somebody has changed their diet, if somebody has gone plant-based and then they start to notice something like that, they're gonna do the correlation equals causation thing. Of, <laughs> oh my gosh, oh my gosh. You know, I'm no longer eating animal foods. That must be what caused this. So we need to really keep tabs on our health. We need to have a physician and maybe some alternative people as well that we trust to, who can let us know what's going on with us, uh, blood work, uh, hormone status, all this kind of thing. So there is nothing that I have ever read in the research 
that says <laughs> that going plant-based causes hair to fall out. Or another one you'll hear is, well, I felt tired. Nothing ever anywhere in the literature that I know of, and please speak up and show your studies if you've got them, that fatigue is caused by eating plant-based. But fatigue and hair loss and headaches and colds and all sorts of things are caused by being human on earth. <laughs> and we need to address that. And this is why I'm very much an ethical vegan. I, I, I will use the V word to describe myself because that is a life commitment. And because I'm an ethical vegan, that if I get tired, if I get headaches, if my hair falls out, I will figure out how to work with that within that context of being vegan. There, there's no other option for me. And I think if we can get people in that different kind of mindset, then they're going to deal with these problems that come along, which they will. You know, we never want to be a movement that says you have to be superhuman. If you get sick, what did you do wrong? If you died before you're 101, what did you do wrong? <laughs> Who would want to be in a group like that? We want to be in a wonderful, welcoming group where we are eating in a way that is health promoting. And yes, things happen. It's Earth. Yes. Yes. And I, and I would add to that. I, I love that was expressed beautifully. That, yeah, That's sometimes beautiful. they may want to look at are they including all the range of healthy plant foods in that vegan diet? Are they including the fruits and vegetables, the, you know, the whole grains, the legumes? Sometimes people do eat a limited diet, you know, like you said, thinking, well, now I've taken out all these things, I don't know what to do. So sometimes they may need um, some help in some guidance on what healthy plant-based foods are. But I'm so with Victoria that like, if your commitment is big enough, you can work through these kind of challenges as you're fine tuning the, the specifics of your way of eating. Yeah. That, that, that's beautiful. And thank you for that, Victoria. And I really need to add, add to this conversation and, and your wonderful, awesome advice that we're not doctors and any kind of health challenges, please definitely go see a doctor and absolutely preferably one that is whole food plan based because <laughs> there's so much there that's going on. There's so many interactions. There's so many things that really uh, that's that's the thing to do is to, to see a doctor. Um, with that, um, there's uh, Marquita asked the question, someone was talking about struggles with buying food for their non-vegan family. A lot of anger around this area. What would you advise around this? Well, I was in a position of having to do this um, for, for my grandmother when she was very old. And it was really hard for me because not only did I believe that whole foods and non-animal foods would have been better for her, I'm an ethical vegan. The idea that I was putting that food into my cart was really difficult. And the same thing happened when I married my husband and we had a blended family and his children would come to visit. And he said, they've gone through enough with a divorce a few years ago and whatnot. So I'm not going to try to change their diet, even though he had, had changed his. So once again, I was in a situation of, of having to purchase these foods. And I do remember being at the supermarket there in my hometown of Kansas City, and I covered up the the cart with my coat because I didn't want anybody to see what was in it. I was so embarrassed that somebody would think I was going to be eating some of these foods that I didn't then and do not now eat. It's been so helpful for me to really sit with the idea, I cannot change another person. I can inspire another person. I can provide information for another person but I can't change them. So when you talk about buying for non-vegan family members, maybe if we're talking about a spouse who is able-bodied and can buy their own food, you might wanna work something out where, okay, you know, you buy your food, I buy my food, you have this 
a shelf of the refrigerator. I have this shelf. Maybe that'll work. But if we're talking about somebody elderly or somebody that you're buying their food out of the goodness of your heart, I can quote Jay Dinshaw, whom I mentioned in my presentation, the founder of the American Vegan Society. And he said that being vegan is about doing the most good and the least harm in every interaction. So yeah, we want them to eat differently and we don't want to be buying animal foods and all these other things. But if in your current situation with a human being who is not ready to change, you know, maybe the most good is just buying them the food. That's certainly how it's turned out for me in my life. And if you find a better way to do it, let me know. Beautiful. So we have a comment here from, from Stone uh, who says, I find myself secretly analyzing and labeling friends, family, clients, and potential clients with a food style ever since Victoria shared the food styles. Uh, and, and she says, he, uh, Stone says that um, it's really fun. It's a really cool and fun way to meet people where they are at a fantastic organic way to find authentic common ground and open a vegan path. That's yeah. beautiful. Thank you for sharing mm -hmm. that. Yeah. Um, I'm aware of the time, Victoria. Yes. Yeah. Well, yes. thank you guys so much. And thanks to everybody who listened. I'm just so excited about what we did at Dot Health is going to do in the world. And we'll stay on, um, but Victoria, I think, has another class that she's needing to go to. Is that correct, Victoria? Yes, yes indeed. Mm -hmm. So I'll see you all next time. All the best. Okay, we bye, so Victoria. appreciate you being here, Victoria. Namaste. <laughs> <you can. laughs> Thank you, Victoria. That was right, wonderful. We love you. Bye-bye. See, see you in Cleveland, and I hope everybody else will join us in Cleveland and be with Victoria and, and get some more of her beautiful wisdom. So thank you, Victoria, and, and enjoy your next class. Thank you. All right. Thank bye you, bye. Victoria. So, um, uh, oh. yeah. And I wanted to mention, you know, um, Jeff Palmer mentioned that, you know, about the fatigue issue, um, that you know that can be also a sign of the detox process with um, switching to plant-based. So that's a really helpful observation. Yeah. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah. with that, uh, Angela, would you like to talk about the second and third practices and that wonderful ebook that that you, sh you were sharing with everybody that, that mm -hmm. you authored? So sure. thank you for that. Yeah, it was wonderful to um, to hear Victoria sharing, and um, we we wanted to honor her time commitment. Uh, she's leading another class immediately after this, so while we um, are sad to have her leave these last few minutes that we were wrapping up, um, we'll just continue on. Um, so you know, this series that we're doing right now is is based in part on some of the principles from the ebook that those of you in the We Did It Dot Health community, um, community have received. And if anybody's watching this that isn't in We Did It Dot Health, please do go to that website and um, fill out their brief survey or questionnaire that will then put you on the email list, and you'll receive the full ebook as a complimentary gift. And so last time we were talking about the stages of change, that was the first practice of the seven best practices to inspire your loved ones to go plant-based. And in last, our last Facebook Live, we talked about being aware of where someone is at in their own readiness for change. And that is a, an important foundation to just mention as I talk about the next two principles or practices. Because again, this idea of if someone is not at all receptive to hearing about a plant-based diet and you know as victoria was sharing then we're kind of trying to push them um, it's rarely received in a way that has the effect that we're hoping for so so once you've kind of become aware of where is this person at with their openness to a plant-based lifestyle or a vegan lifestyle how receptive are they to this you know you're sort of aware of that 
And then the next two practices, um, once you've sort of become aware of, are they somewhat open? Is there some receptivity to hearing more, you know, about my experience or for them to apply any of this in their own life? And if there is even a little bit, then, you know, being aware that whatever you share, practice number two is tailor your message to their deepest concerns. And you know, so often we want to share information that's important to us. And that, and that can be great. You know, we can share like, oh, wow, I've had this, you know, change in lifestyle and I'm feeling great. And you want to share that with people. But at some point, if you're wanting to inspire them, you will also want to be aware of what actually interests them. You know, are they someone that really cares about the planet where learning more about, you know, how what we eat, you know, can so deeply affect the environment? There's quotes about, you know, vegans actually, you know, save 1,500 gallons of water a day on a vegan diet compared to a meat eater, um, and so many other great statistics that you can share with someone that cares about that if, if they're open to that. If they're a very compassionate person, they might be more open to some of the issues about the ethics and about animals. Um, but it seems like the door that most people come in to the plant-based lifestyle is often the health door and you know because so many people are struggling with health issues so you know you might be aware of what their concerns are related to health and look for those opportunities where they may be receptive to hearing like wow you know so and so has diabetes too but they really had this really great healing through the, you know eating this kind of whole food plant based kind of way of eating do you want to learn more about it so you're you're being aware of their concerns. And I, I kind of think of that as you're sort of connecting to what their potential why might be, because we all sort of have to have our why for making a change in lifestyle. We rarely just change without having something that's deeply motivating to us. Um, and that also involves being a good listener. If we just um, say what we want to say, but uh, don't actually listen to like what their concerns and challenges and hopes are, it's a one-sided conversation. And I know for me, when I first became vegetarian and then vegan, I just became frustrated that why don't other people see this? You know, why don't they see what I see about animals and health and, and the planet? And I just had to kind of take a step back and realize I didn't become vegetarian or vegan overnight. Um, it were, there was a journey for me to wake up to this, what I've come to realize. And we are, we are trained in our cultures to really disconnect from how animals are treated, um, from what is actually healthy eating, from all the messages we get from the media and other things. So it's just a real process for people to sometimes really awaken to this new way of eating. So just having that kind of patience helped me realize I have to take a step back. I have to take what I actually know as a psychologist about communication and actually apply it. <laughs> it's not easy to do because we really want, you know, people to change um, for their own health and for so many other reasons. So, so one is just, you know, that practice number two is tailor your message to what their concerns are or what interests them or what their goals are. And really start from heart, um, start from heart in how you communicate. What is my intention? What do I, you know, what am I hoping for here? Sometimes our biggest goal has to be just to have some healthy communication that opens the door to, to them having some interest, curiosity and hope. So the, the second or the third practice is what are their barriers to change? And what that means is basically what gets in the way of them being open to a plant-based diet? And I, and I think of this as the how. It's really hard to make a change if we don't see it as being possible. And for many people, plant-based eating seems impossible because it's just so outside of their realm of how they've eaten growing up in our traditional kind of way of eating that has become so processed and so fast food. And I know for me, um, I was not a cook. I was not... Um, a person that really ate that healthy before, uh, I found just figuring out what to eat every day kind of a struggle. And and I ate a lot of the kind of processed, salty, sugary, fatty foods that many of us kind of get addicted to in our culture. So I could not imagine 
you know, how I would eat plant-based. And so for me, it was when I found a strong enough why that kind of made me determined to learn the how. So, you know, and, and also eating someone else's delicious plant-based food actually made me realize it was doable. So just realize that you, sh you know, figure out what are their barriers and figure out how you can be a support to them. You know, what, what do they need support with? Do they need to know some great recipes that replicate their favorite foods? Do they need you to maybe cook with them sometime? Um, do they need to go to a class with you where they might learn something if they're open to this? So, so just being aware of how you can support them with these challenges that they're having as a thought partner and a ally, not as someone that knows all the answers necessarily. So... I think I'll leave it at that for now. Um, and I know there may be some additional questions if we can. Get yeah, to th there are some questions. And uh, yeah, the possibilities, it, that, that was a beautiful presentation, Angela. And, you know, possibilities, what, what that reminded me when you talked about possibilities is it's really so often uh, based on our beliefs. And, and that's what we, we want to look at is what what are our beliefs and other people's beliefs. Uh, we I'd like to share this comment. So Terry uh, says that after she uh, presented a lot of information about a plant-based life, whole food plant-based lifestyle to somebody, his response was, uh, I could never ad adapt to your program as I am a devout carnivore and I choose quality of life over quantity of life. Uh, you know, I, to me, what, what I've realized uh, recently is that when we're talking about, you know, quality of life, really talking about uh, length, length of life, and, and there's a lot of conversation about how a whole food plant-based lifestyle gives us a longer life, but it's really the conversation I think also needs to include the quality of life because really what happens is what is the quality of life of somebody who's who's diabetic for the last 10, 20 years of their life? What is the quality of life, you know, for somebody who has to have stents and bypass surgeries and open heart surgeries? So so really maybe our conversation in the first place rather than quantity of life, living longer, is, is really about how much suffering people have with, with the traditional chronic diseases in our culture. And uh, so, yes, qu quality of life for this guy, Terry, um, yeah, the quality of life. What, what will it look like for him when he's, he's, he's suffering from a chronic disease? So I, I, I think we really can and maybe would want to shift that conversation of, of quantity of life because it really is the quality of life mm. for being whole food plant-based. So thank you for that, Terry, and, and all the best with your potential client. I sure hope you can get through to him, and um, he certainly could use your wonderful help because I know you're a beautiful coach and, and wonderful support for anybody who, who chooses to work with you. Yeah. Yeah, and Jeff shares some great... Um, statistics and information that really shows that for for many people it is very hard and maybe men in particular to sometimes imagine giving up meat and honoring that um, challenge I, I would add to what peter said um, that you you know i think that quality of life discussion is a great entry point of like okay you know if if your quality of life really declines and you're still alive but not feeling well or able to do what you love to do is that really quality of life sometimes i do think too and this will come up in a future um, facebook live class that we have is often things like those documentaries or sharing something that might speak to him of somebody that's similar to him that made the change and how they benefited in terms of their health um, something like that could be helpful for someone like him like hey here's a, a documentary if you still don't want to work with me once you've seen this that I, I respect your decision but are you willing to like watch this and see if you might be more open to it because sometimes there's just if they learn about another man or somebody that they relate to that made this kind of change and are really loving it sometimes they might be more open so yeah that's beautiful 
Well, thank you for that. that let me uh, look through these comments and questions. I know we've had so many wonderful comments and so many people expressing their appreciation for everything that you and Victoria are doing. And Victoria obviously has been a leader in mm-hmm. in the vegan movement, and and she certainly has a lot of a lot of followers, a lot of people who just love her work. And and uh, um, go ahead. I was going to say, it looks like Shannon has a question. Um, what do you think is a good way to inspire someone whose barrier to change is that they were previously vegan but quit? Ah, uh, that's a good question. Yeah, I guess I'd be curious about what didn't work for them about the vegan lifestyle. You know, what what got in the way before? Um, what problems did they run into? And how might you then invite them if they're open to explore ways to kind of support them, depending on what those challenges were, you know, was it that they didn't find, you know, the way of plant-based eating that really worked for them? Was it the lack of social support? Um, Were there health issues that, you know, they were blaming the vegan diet for, um, but whether that was the cause or not, you know, are there, sometimes I think just lack of support is part of the challenge that we face because, so being part of like other plant-based and or vegan groups that can help them like work through these issues. And and of course, as Peter mentioned earlier, if it is a health issue, a plant-based doctor or nutritionist can be really, really helpful, obviously. Okay. Well, um, is there any other questions? We're, we're coming up to the top of the hour in a couple minutes, and I just want to see if anybody has any last questions. Or, Angela, do you have any other thoughts you'd like to add? Um, not really. I'm just looking to yeah. see. So um, one, one of our upcoming projects, I'll share a little bit about this, is uh, the Fountain of Youth Gallery. So I we're going to find a way to show people how we're supposed to age. So a gallery of people who are 60 plus and and thriving and being radiant and active so that actually this, I guess this goes back to the quality and quantity of life. So, you know, it's it doesn't have to be one or the other. It's really about having both, having the quantity of life and thriving to an old age as well as the quality and, and, and being thriving and active and happy and contributing for for a lot of years. I think as Dr. Furman, I've heard him say once that uh, people are designed to live long and die fast. So mm-hmm. meaning that he, he was saying that we, we the human body's designed, I guess, for for lack of better way to say it, but we're, we're supposed to live to be about 100, he said, and, and we're supposed to pretty much die overnight or maybe take a week to die rather than suffering for decades. Yeah. So somebody just asked about how to get the ebook. Okay. Right. So the ebook, um, I guess if you haven't answered the survey question at we did it that health, that's our free gift for participating in the Million Healthy Lives scoreboard. So please go to to the we did it that health and answer the question. If you have, we, we didn't have the uh, ebook available for, for a while. So if you've uh, participated in the survey before the ebook was available, uh, please uh, write me and uh, or Angela and we'd be happy to share it with you. And uh, we did it that health, and I'm Peter G. At we did it that health. So I, I, I hope you get it and and enjoy it. It's we have had so much wonderful feedback. Angela does such a wonderful job on on the book, and the the feedback, the the compliments just keep coming in about it. And and with that, anything else? Anybody? Do you see any other comments, Angela? Some people expressing appreciation. A lot of people expressing yeah, appreciation. Thank, and I appreciate it's great to see everybody that's here. Yeah, it, it's it's wonderful. Thank you all for coming and we so appreciate you. And and we are looking to do one of these every second Saturday 
at 11 o'clock Eastern. And uh, we have, this is the second, we have two more uh, with Angela and uh, looking forward to continuing the series with other experts and, and experts in fields other than the nutrition and medical fields. We, we're wanting to keep having the conversations of how do we communicate better? How do we find the most appropriate exact information, especially for somebody who's not plant-based yet? So let's grow the plant-based movement and let's, let's do it by inspiring people we care about, people that we have a relationship with already and and we know and they and we, we know I know that we all want to see everybody be healthier happier and have both quality and quantity of life so, <laughs> so thank you very much um, anything else anybody wanted to share here other than their amazing appreciation and and Wanda says remember go to Eventbrite and sign up for the summit and I would add to that, please go to, to the National Health Association's website uh, and uh, sign up for, for their amazing conference, which includes some of the leading uh, folks in the, in the plant-based nutrition, doctors, uh, lifestyle. And uh, I know you'll love it. Great people to network with. And, and come to our summit. We'll have workshops and talks by some amazing people, Angela and Victoria, two of them. So thank you so much, everybody. Thank you. And I would love to show you something that I've, I've seen recently. And uh, that's, that could become our secret vegan handshake, which is namaste vegan. <laughs> So th thank you and bye see, bye. see you next month bye bye